being poor, we only really had the answer. I'm one of six, and I grew up on Social Security. My dad passed away at the age of 40 and left a 39-year-old widow with six kids. We lived off at $800 a month, so I know what poor is. We had our food stamps, we did it. That was life. All six of us got a college education. My mom wouldn't stand for us not to want more for ourselves. Education, it's trade. Without that, we're all going to be poor. There is no right answer for why someone's poor. Lack of education, lack of trade, then there is no money. I can't sit here and say that I have a story of uh, being poor, but my parents, came from poor conditions. My father was from uh, the country of Georgia, Savannah, uh, outside of Savannah, Georgia, where he worked on a farm and his parents were sharecroppers. My mother grew up on Tamron Avenue uh, with a lack of things, but they wanted more for us. And, and the way they got about that was getting their education. And that was what the key was. It comes from me having a lack of knowledge and a lack of education. And we've got to make sure that we're instilling within our boys and girls the knowledge they need in order to be successful in life. We've got to make sure that they too know how to read and know how to write and know how to put subject and verb together and agree and to be able to write paragraphs and reports and essays. So when they grow up and they begin to fill out applications and they put their resumes together, they have the information and knowledge that they need in order to... Thank you. Um, I agree with some of what has been said. Clearly jobs is an issue, and clearly education is extremely important, which is why at least I think most, if not all of us are here. But I want to point out that if multi-generational lack of opportunity based on race is the primary root cause of poverty in our country, if you look at the statistics, and if you look at any statistics, any, any ones, and you match the people, their characteristics, education and all, and compare by race, black people have fewer opportunities. The statistics prove it. And so I want to be clear that racism is alive and well. It is not that excuse. I don't even think I'm saying that. But I want to be clear that some people can rise up, put on some pearls, and go over to the Trump plaza, and some people can't, okay? And so what I hope to do is to use this school district, it's clear to me that the school district has to be the next economic engine for our community. Thank you. I would look at this answer a bit more from a spiritual perspective. For those of you that believe in God, we know that there is an enemy. And when there's an enemy, there's always going to be poverty, there's always going to be conditions that are bad. And the reason for that is because there's an enemy, and it's also because when good people do nothing, bad's allowed to flourish. There's an obligation for people that have to help others. And that's my, that comes from my spiritual views and my, and my faith. So for me, when you say, why is there poverty? It's because there's an enemy, and it's because good people do nothing. There's a lot of research out about the wealthiest Americans, and most of them actually grew up poor. And it wasn't education that made them successful, it was actually really, really hard work and getting along well with people. You can educate somebody with a PhD level, if they're not motivated, they, they too will be poor. You know, I live in Boca Raton, there's a lot of money around where I live, and, and there's a lot of slacker students, I tutor some of them. And, uh, you know, if they're not successful, they move in with their parents, or their parents buy them a house, or their parents buy them a car, or their parents need what, what they need. Other poor communities aren't able to do that. This is why I support the Common Core, because there's a, there's a capacity called grit, tenacity, and perseverance. And what they're trying to do is not just educate you in math and English and history and things like that that people need to kind of have those basic skills to be successful, but they implement the character trait of hard work and trustworthiness and perseverance because that is what pulls people out of poverty. So you're going to see a lot of people that are, you know, maybe wealthy and well educated because daddy paid for college. But if they didn't have daddy, they would be poor too, just like everybody else. They're just lucky. So what we have to understand is that the research suggests that we really need grit, tenacity, and perseverance. I just want to remind everyone um, the superintendent task force had discovered that we have a deficit model of teaching and a deficit model of everything that's going on. So in the deficit, uh, we're going to have to look at that way in order to move ourselves forward as it relates to poverty. And, and the next question, 
Are you in support of the ongoing training of unborn racism for all staff, along with the continued funding for this training? Absolutely. Um, I think that's a fascinating training and I can't wait to attend. I'm going to be there in September when it occurs and I think that it should be mandatory for all of our staff to attend. I think you can't deal with an issue until you identify it and that's what we need to do as a school district. As a teacher throughout my career, I've attended all sorts of trainings pertaining to racism in the classroom and in the school institutional institute. Um, I agree that it's, it's extremely important that we continue these types of trainings for, for one reason. Even teachers who are not racist, who have no racist tendencies, it still helps any teacher to understand the situation that another person goes through based on their racial experiences and their racial history in this country. So whether or not there's racism in the classroom, in certain cases there is, in certain cases there isn't, everybody, everybody who works in the schools with the diverse population that we have benefits from understanding what different races and different cultures and ethnicities go through so this training is extremely valuable, if only to gain perspective, to truly understand the students we're trying to teach. Otherwise, you're going to be at a disadvantage in getting them to learn and trust you in the classroom as a teacher. Thank you. And I've had the training, and I do believe we need to continue, but I think it needs to go a step further. I think we've got to take it to the level of actually implementing and looking at what we do once we have secured the training. I've had it three times now, and I know when you go back to your workaday place, it seems like you've forgotten what you've learned. It's got to be a way, a mechanism uh, from the school board and the administration working with the teachers and the parents and the community on how we talk about it, we dissect it more, and when we see it rising with its ugly head, we take it apart. But we've got to do that, not just in a training. It's got to be continuous. Thank you. Thanks. I agree. I support it. I've gone through the training. It was very rewarding. We also, in the leadership of the school district, had an opportunity a few years back where Citrix, a company in South Florida, sponsored some executive level training at the Darden School of Business of the University of Virginia. And it had a, a, an undoing racism component to it as well that was very rewarding. So I agree that we need to keep that in as a staple and uh, secure the funding to keep that uh, ongoing. This is a really interesting question because just this past spring, I actually got to attend the workshop at the district. It was a great training. First thing I actually learned is racism. It's there. You have people in one room with multiple races. It's there. I actually walked out thinking, racism? I'm not a racist. What, what are they talking about? So then, of course, you know, you go back the second day, and it's not what you think you believe in, it's not what you think you stand for, it's what's going on around you. It's a really, really good training. I support it 110%. I really think it should actually grow a little bit and include more rather than like this past spring. Everyone there but me has already been there. Well, there's a lot of people in our district that wasn't there. They weren't invited, they didn't know it existed. I went the following week and was talking about it at other schools. It's a really, really good workshop and it does a lot for this district. I do believe that we should continue doing the racism training in the classroom as well as funding it. But I also believe too that we need to take a step further as mentioned earlier. I think we also need to make sure that our students are getting racism training as well because they too have to be sure, have to make sure that they know why they're doing what they're doing and why they're doing it. They have to make, we have to know whether or not no, they are racist or not. Racism does exist. We have to let them know that it continues even until today. Even though we're 40 and 50 years away from uh, uh, integration and segregation and those things, they still need to understand that racism does exist and we still need to make sure that they get trained as well. And we need to introduce more programs like that within the classroom. I've been the primary pusher of this training. This is a training that I've been to multiple times over the past 18 years or so. And every time I go, I get additional insight on essentially what's wrong and why some people can't seem to get ahead. And, and even my own biases, because you know the biases of race and all other biases, they're not unique to white people. Um, I fully support continuing the training. And just for those of you who don't know, in addition to the training, for the first time this uh, a few months ago, we had a phase two training with district administration. 
And we've been meeting once a month to talk about what racism looks like in our district and again, how we can systematically and systemically change it. Not just have a training, not just have a little happy talk, but make systemic changes. And so I hope that each of us will also support the work, the work of Dr. John Brown and his walking the equity walk. When I taught, my black students didn't want me to teach them as a black student. They wanted me to teach them as a student. Race is a tool of division, and the sooner we wake up to that, that's when we'll really solve the race problem in this country. Race is used to divide us. My black students didn't want me to see them as a black student. They wanted me to see them as a student. So for me, when we talk about race, it's continuing to divide us instead of bringing us together. So for me, I don't support it. What I support is, is treating everybody the same. When you look at a black student and see them differently, that's racist, because then you're putting limitations on them. And I never did that with my students, and I never will. Race is a tool of division. As far as this uh, anti-discrimination policy or training, um, obviously, I would support discrimination in any capacity. We all people should know that. Um, you know, but the thing is, we have to talk about programs and effectiveness. I mean, it sounds great to have an anti-discrimination policy, but we have to actually measure the level of discrimination that's happening right now, and then measure the discrimination that's happening after the training. Is it effective? Is discrimination going up as a result of the training? So without looking at the data um, with high sample sizes, we really don't know how effective these programs are. I would support any program that would get rid of discrimination. Now we talk about racism specifically, think historically. There was times when women could not work. You were not allowed to leave the house at work. You were not allowed to vote, okay? And then Rosa Parks didn't give up her seat on the bus, which was great. And, that, and at that time, people were like, oh my God, how could she do that, right? And now we have civil rights progress. Look at homosexual people today. I mean, look at the discrimination that they faced. In the 80s, teachers who were gay were being sought after and fired. Okay, and then there's people like myself who engage in perfectly lawful conduct on my own time and not discriminate against. There's teachers who model in bikinis and they lose their jobs and they're great teachers. We need to end discrimination and when we do that, better teachers will come in because they won't choose other careers so they don't have to live under a microscope. Thank you. And I'm very fortunate I was able to attend the Undoing Racism training and I look forward to going through it again. You know, at first I thought, why am I doing this? I don't discriminate. I learned so much about myself. I was told it would change me, and it did change me. One of the things I learned, which is actually going to sound funny to all of you, but through the training I learned that because I'm Jewish, I'm not really part of that white group that, you know, that had targeted certain groups, that I'm not seen as being white. And I understood that piece, and it was very interesting. Um, I found that I, I was changed and touched. I don't think you can get to the root of discrimination against disabilities or against person's sexual persuasion until we get back into the roots of where discrimination started, where the racial discriminated started, where the oppression of people, the preconceived notions that we don't even know that we have. I have spoken to the superintendent about expanding the training. I look forward for, to all of us getting the training and all of us going through phase two, phase three, and whatever else we need until it's time done. What do you think about the initiatives that are coming out of the African and African American Male Task Force? Um, I was able to achieve the most recent task force meeting. Uh, my principal at Park Vista High School is one of the committee members on one of the many subcommittees that exist on the task force. It's my understanding that for years it languished, for years it did not meet, for years it was ineffective because people from the community didn't tend to engage as they had promised to. But those numbers, the number of people attending, has increased recently. And the feedback that I've gotten from individuals who serve on the various committees of the task force are that there is positive momentum going forward. So I think that if the district keeps up the efforts, if more people continue to engage with the committee, which covers a wide range of issues that lead to disadvantaged people in schools and not getting proper educations and not getting what they need to go out to the workforce, I think that the task force has a foot in the right direction right now. And as long as we keep our foot on the gas, we can make sure to get progress out of this task force.